the, called Experts. And Orson did the trailer, which we are going to see later, I hope. It's a wonderful trailer. It's actually, the film talks about lies, and, uh, and his trailer is a lie in itself. Does she know more than she's telling? Ladies and gentlemen. Or is she telling more than she knows? Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to provide a few words of explanation. <clears throat> now, how shall I begin? You're talking about what movies. Begin with the director. You ought to do that. Modesty forbids. Oh? Oh. Well, we all know what the critics have said about the movie. Our movie coming soon to this theater? Delicious. Delirious. Delightful. Go on. I'm quoting the critics. They've acclaimed it as a cinematic... I know one thing. I never offered a painting or a drawing to a museum who didn't buy it. That never refused one. The author of the fake autobiography was also the author of a real biography about a faker, the great art faker, Elmire. Great faker of the 20th century becomes a modern folk hero for the rest of us who have a bit of loss in ourselves, but simply don't have the courage or the opportunity to, to, to express it. <clears throat> the following commercial message, which is fairly brief and completely dishonest, concerns the advent soon on this same screen of the motion picture entitled F for Fake, which rips the veil of secrecy from a whole series of scandalous items. For instance, the 22 Picassos worth who knows how many millions. How did this young woman get her hands on them? Why did her grandfather soak them all in gasoline and burn them to ashes? People wonder why it was so difficult to get permission to show this film in America. They should remember that when F for Fake was playing to packed houses in the rest of the world, Howard Hughes was still alive. Supposedly. And if Coda was carrying on with Picasso in the south of France, how did Hughes? who was busy at the time growing his toenails in Vancouver, make it to those secret meetings on the Mexican pyramid. And what about the tiger? Who is under that sheet? By what strange chain of circumstances did this savage beast move from Managua to a penthouse swimming pool in Beloit, Wisconsin? And who is this man? C.F. for fake, the movie that dares to ask that question. The uh, UFOs, Gary, we were going to mention, remember, that the unidentified flying objects only appeared after my radio broadcast? And what about that flying object? And here... Ladies and gentlemen, suppose I come right out with it and admit to you now that my old Martian hoax on the radio was... well, not exactly... a hoax. that there were secret sponsors of that broadcast who were, in fact, some rather influential beings from outer space. You smile. Ten seconds more, Orson. I think they're smiling, Gary, and I'd just like to remind them that it is since that broadcast that there have been in this country alone authenticated sightings. You still think it's a joke? Good. That's the way we want you to feel about it, for now. We'd like to make this little commercial message as modest as possible. So we'll just say that critics all over the world have called it a masterpiece. The trailer for F for Fake was rejected by the American distributors. Too long, too extravagant. He was disappointed about that because he wanted to explore this new avenue of film essay. But as he said, a movie maker's paint box was much too expensive and that's why sometimes, rarely, but sometimes he regretted for not continuing painting, although he thought of himself as a second-rate painter. Or, for example, what, what, how Europeans looked at American tourists. Or the doorman of a chic French hotel looked at that tourist. I'm talking about France, he's a little French clochard. 
I kept a lot of pictures. Orson hated, as I told you, memorabilia, and he would doodle and so on, and then he would just squash it and throw it away and so on. And I was always around saving things, and you know, so I don't have as many as one would think. Through 20 years, I could have accumulated so many things. Orson Welles in everyday life, well, he was not at all this man bigger than life that everybody imagines. Behind his appearance, there was a modesty and even timidity. He hated this image of a megalomaniac that people had of him, and this was his answer to that. Hero, tragedian, megalomaniac, often mistaken for the grand roles he so loved, he enjoyed playing with these cliches. In England's green and pleasant land, few stately homes have entered the hectic hurly-burly of showbiz more recently than Plumfield Manor. In opening your beautiful home to the public, uh, Lord Plumfield, just what are your aim? To give the tourist jolly good value for his money. Hmm. Do you feel you're keeping up with your competitors in the other stately homes? Some of them all you get is a guided tour of the kitchen garden and a quick look at the family thumbscrew. Shall we put on hair? It's best the county. Hello. This is my son, Algin. Ah. How do you do? Hello. Gosh. Oh, I say, golly. Mm. Golly mm. good, Algin. Mm. Thank you, Peter. Another, mm. another. Mm. And, uh, there's my wife. Countess. She's a great favorite of the tourists. She's a very fine dramatic recitation. Ah, Lady Plumfield. And if pushed, she'll take off her cardigan. There's the butler, Blemish. Oh? He does animal impressions. Do some of your animal impressions, Blemish. He says he doesn't want to. Pity. Temperamental old devil. I'd give him the sack, but we need the eggs. You seem to be giving the tourists wonderful entertainment. It just seems a pity you're stuck out here in the country. Oh, we're hoping to bring the show into town. Just as soon as we can sell the house. But then you'll have nowhere to live. Huh. We don't live in the house. We live here. Would you care for a cup of tea? Lord Plumfield versus Wells. A small puzzle in two parts and from two different times. Years after the first shoot, he finished it with the reverse shots of himself as the journalist. This house was his atelier for several years, a mini film studio where he could work on his own projects in peace. Scene 58, take one. Okay. No. Scene. The after deck. A fair morning. Tied up, twisted, eyes like coal still glowing in the ashes of a ruin. Ahab lifts up to the clearness of the morn his splintered helmet of a brow. This glad, this happy air, this winsome sky, at last seems almost to dissolve the canker-wrinkled beating in his heart. The cruel stepmother world now throws affectionate arms around that stubborn neck. Old Ahab drops a tear into the sea. Now does the vast Pacific hold such wealth? Is that one drop? Cut. It's unbelievable that after 20 years, after squatters raped this house, the traces of Orson's work are still here. He was always doing different projects at the same time. Occasionally, I would leave him for a day or two, and when back, he would present me with something new, like Moby Dick, for example. He started to shoot it with his own money all by himself. 
Uh, if I remember well, between some shots of F of A. One evening, he simply asked his cameraman to stay a little longer. And that was the beginning. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long, I thought that I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. Whenever I grow grim about the mouth and hazy in the eyes, whenever it's a damp November in my soul, I count it time to get to sea. Almost all men, sometime or other, cherish these same feelings toward the ocean. Why did the old Persians hold the ocean holy? And the still deeper meaning of that story of Narcissus, who, because he could not grasp the mild, tormenting image in the fountain, plunged into it and drowned. That same image we ourselves see in all rivers, in oceans and in lakes and wells. The image of the ungraspable, the phantom of life. And that is the key to it all. 